about is it's a pretty thorny issue that we're going to be talking about today. And I don't mean to say that I'm going to share something controversial. Um, what we're going to talk today is a very thorny issue, not controversial, but we're going to go deep into the Word of Yahweh and examine a particular element in our world today that was not a part of the original six days of creation. Do you know there were certain plants, or at least you know possibly features on plants, um, that were never present during the Garden of Eden, or anywhere on the earth where when Yahweh made Adam, and uh, the the plant, or at least the feature on the plant, is thorns. Thorns were not a part of the original creation. Um, you ever heard the phrase, uh, every rose has its thorn? Uh, well, that doesn't appear to be true originally. It wasn't until Adam's sin that Yahweh cursed the ground with thorns. Now, the story does not end there. Because as we dig deep into the scriptures... We find a very intriguing message, and it's a message of warning, and it is a message of thorns. Now we're going to go from, in the scriptures, we're going to go from Genesis to Revelation and see how the thorns are weaved into the picture that Yahweh has, for a very neat picture Yahweh has for us. And um, because in the beginning, when Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that was in them, he created man from dust. He created man from the dust of the earth. So we are dust. Genesis 2, 7. And Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being, a living soul. Yahweh Elohim planted a garden eastward in Eden. The word Eden means paradise. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And so we are created from the dust of the ground. Now it's evident even scientifically. We've learned in science that in order for us to literally survive, we have to partake of dirt. We have to partake of the nutrients that are found in the soil. Because it's from the ground that we are created. It's from the ground that we get the nutrients that we need. Now, just as we were born with a choice, the ground from which Adam was made also yielded for Adam a choice. A choice of life or death. And as we all know, Adam and Eve chose to disobey Yahweh by eating fruit from the forbidden tree, Genesis 2.15. Then Yahweh took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And so when... When Adam chose to partake of this forbidden fruit, we know the story. And the ground from which <clears throat> he was the ground from which he was made became cursed. And this curse with this curse has something coming from the ground that we've all had negative experience with. Thorns. Genesis three seventeen, then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife. And have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so, thorns and thistles... Will, will come up as as he is trying to eat from the ground. 
And so thorns were not a part of the original creation. Yahweh, who planted Adam in the garden, was desirous that good fruit would come from Adam. But what he found was that Adam yielded ugly fruit, the ugly fruit of sin. And so, conversely, Yahweh then added thorns and thistles to creation, which starts off as a weed and ultimately prevents our plantings from bearing good fruit. And so here in Genesis, Yahweh introduced thorns to make the ground harder to yield fruit. Now remember, we are made from the dust of the earth. Before, it was easy for Adam to tend to the garden. He could cause it to bear good fruit. No thorns would come up. But now, it would be more difficult. In the same way, just as it was easy before for Adam to walk in righteousness... Now, because of the sin nature, the thorns in Adam's flesh, walking in righteousness, would prove more difficult. Now, this is the nature of sin, is it not? The more we commit, the more we get tangled into, the harder it can be to get out and to be free. And so Yahweh drove Adam and Eve from the garden and placed cherubim to guard the way to the tree of life, cherubim. Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, Genesis 3.22, to know good and evil, and now lest he put his, out his hand to take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore Yahweh Elohim sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. As we now know, Yahweh dwells between the cherubim. And since this time man sought and, and since the time that Adam was removed from the presence of Yahweh, man has sought to find his way back home. But sin has separated man from his Elohim. Now fast forward to Abraham's day. Yahweh what was desirous to save man from his sinful condition. And so he started with a family. He started with Abraham. Abraham through Abraham there was promised a seed. And that's capital S E E D seed the Messiah. Because Abraham was faithful and obedient and was willing to give Yahweh everything he had, including his own son. Yahweh told Abraham, Genesis 22, verse 2, he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which Elohim had told him. Now later on in verse 9 it says, Then they came to the place of which Elohim had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his son and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of Yahweh came, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear Elohim, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. The ram's horn, um, formerly a place of thorns, would one day signal our freedom as we will see later. But Abraham was faithful 
with all of his household because he was faithful and because he was obedient he made a very important promise here to Abraham in Genesis 22:14 he said and Abraham called the name of the place Yahweh will provide as it is said to this day the mount of Yahweh it shall be provided and then the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time out of heaven said by myself I have sworn, says Yahweh, because you have done this thing, have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. And that seed is, as we've shared in our Galatians study, our, that seed is the Messiah. All the nations of the earth were blessed through the Messiah. Because Abraham was willing to offer his own son. Yahweh looked upon that and says, I will offer my son with Abraham. Because Abraham, when he uh, put Isaac on the altar... That was basically saying, you can have my children. And one of those children was the seed of Abraham, Messiah Yahshua. All right, the next appearance of thorns, Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. Now, if you look into the Hebrew here, you'll find that, and just do a little in-depth study, you'll find that this bush was a thorn bush. Now, normally, thorn bushes burn very quickly by fire. I mean, if you ever thrown thorns into a fire, it doesn't take long and they're consumed, right? Well, in this case, it wasn't. And that made it all the more curious. And so, how is it that the thorn bush dwells in fire and yet was not consumed? Well, the analogy here is fitting because Yahweh came to Moshe. He was announcing deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage. From sin, and so how was it that that man in his that that man in his sinful and thorny condition would be able to dwell with Yahweh, a consuming fire, and yet be delivered? And so, when when Yahweh appeared to Abraham in a thorn bush, a fiery thorn bush, and the thorn bush was not consumed. Man has yielded nothing but thorn, the thorns of sin, in the same way the ground yields the thorns as a, the curse. And so when, he, when, when Moshe appears unto Abraham in a fiery thorn bush, and yet the thorn bush is not consumed, that is a message of deliverance. That even though man in, would, was in a sinful state, yet he would dwell with a consuming fire. And this is just the beginning. Now Yahweh, when bringing the children of Israel to the promised land, stopped at a place called Mount Sinai. In Hebrew, it's Sinai. And the word Sinai means thorny. That's what the word Sinai, Sinai means. And so he would appear unto the children of Israel as a consuming fire to deliver to them a fiery law. Exodus chapter 24, verse 17. The sight of the glory of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Yahweh came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand came a fiery law from them, for them. That's Exodus 24, verse 17. Deuteronomy 33, and verse 2. 
And so he gave them a fiery law upon the place of thorns. Now, they were afraid that they would be consumed in the process and asked that the law be given through a mediator, Moshe, fearing that they, in their thorny state, would perish. Exodus 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off, and they said to Moshe, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not Elohim speak with us, lest we die. Now in the wilderness, Yahweh commanded that they make a tabernacle, a tabernacle and an ark out of acacia wood. And he would often overlay that acacia wood with gold. And um, acacia wood, this is a picture here of an acacia tree. This is the branches of an acacia tree found in the Egypt area, in Israel area. Look at the thorns on that thing. Ouch. Now, Yahweh made, was, was willing to make an ark out of this cursed wood. And that ark would, dim it, would be the place where he is said to dwell between the cherubim, the cherubim. Now it says in Exodus 25.10, They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and out you shall overlay it, and shall make on it a molding of gold all around. And so this acacia tree is... A thorn, basically a thorn tree. It's very. Uh, it has wood. That's just one of the branches. And so our Elohim, who is a consuming fire, instructed that the ark of the covenant be made with acacia wood, yet adorned with gold, adorned with glory. And there he commanded that cherubim would be placed on the ark, and the cherubim with its fiery sword is what kept Adam from the Garden of Eden. And upon the side of the ark was the Torah, the fiery sword. And so Yahweh, with his fiery sword, the Torah, still dwells, as it says, that the earthly ark is a picture of the heavenly ark, still dwells behind the covering cherubim. And so we would see that yet there is hope. There is some way, some access to the Father through a high priest into that holy place to restore man back to the place of Eden once again and not be held back by the fiery sword, the Torah, which condemns us and not be prevented from seeing Elohim because of the covering Cherubim and being restored back to fellowship with him again. And so there was hope that Yahweh had made this ark out of thorn wood. And Yahweh would find a way through the seed of Abraham, through the Melchizedek priesthood, to bring back man into fellowship with him again and even make man formerly nothing but a tree of thorns a special dwelling place for his spirit and be crowned with glory. And so we are that dwelling place. How fitting that he would choose the acacia tree, a tree of thorns of which we have been made of and turned it into something beautiful, overlaying it with gold. And so that's another example. Now the last place that Israel would would encamp prior to their time of crossing the Jordan was a place called an acacia grove. Joshua chapter 3 verse 1, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from acacia grove, 
and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. And so the place in which they were encamped was a place of thorns. Literally in Hebrew, Abel Shittim, field of thorns. And so Moshe, the lawgiver, was not permitted to take them across the Jordan into the promised land because he had also sinned. It would take a man named, man named Joshua. Now Joshua in the Hebrew is Yahshua, the same name as Yahshua the Messiah. And so Joshua the high priest, or Joshua, Yahshua the high priest, would take us, all of us, and will take all of us, from this thorny world that we live in, this place of thorns, across the Jordan and into the land of promise. Now it was Yahushua who took us, not Moshe, because the law cannot save us. The law cannot save us, but Yahushua, he can take us across to Jordan. Moshe himself had sinned, was guilty of sin, was in need of Yahushua. And so, Yahushua is the one who saves us from the curses. Now, Yahweh warned the children of Israel once they entered that promised land. Once they entered that land, that this was going to be a cleansing process. These men would become the fire of Yahweh, destroying and burning up all the thorns of the land. He told them to completely destroy them. Don't leave anything. Completely destroy them. Because he did not want those the planting, the plants that were in that land, the people that were of thorns, that were not of not bearing good fruit. He did not want those thorns to destroy Israel and to prevent Israel from bearing good fruit. And so he told them, utterly destroy them, completely obliterate them. But they would not. And he warned them. Numbers 33, verse 55, he says, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides. And they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. In Joshua 23, um, sorry, 23, verse 12, it says, Or else if in, uh, or else if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you and make marriages with them and go into them and they to you, know for certain that Yahweh your Elohim will no longer drive out these inhabitants, these nations, from before you, but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges in your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which Yahweh your Elohim has given you. He warned them. Get rid of the thorns, or they will be thorns in your eyes, and thorns in your sides, and they will not be destroyed from among you, and they will destroy you. And so, now the day of Yahweh is a day of burning. Yahweh was putting the children of Israel um, into this, this promised land and causing them to be like the day of Yahweh to the heathen that were living there. And so he was calling them to go in and destroy with the sword the power, the word of Yahweh, with the sword destroying the people who were dwelling there, cutting down the thorn bushes of the land. But since they didn't cut down the thorn bushes of the land, they became like them. In Second Samuel 23, verse 6 and 7, it says, But the sons of, the re sons of rebellion shall be as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. The man who touches them must be armed with iron, the shaft of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. And so he he wanted them 
to be that spear, that sword, to cut down the thorns of the land, to destroy them. But they chose not to. Now we have our own picture here. Because we need to, to guard ourselves against the thorns of the land. Proverbs 22 verse 5 says, Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse. He who guards his soul will be, will be far from them. And you know, the heathen, when they're practicing their sin and their drinking parties and the things that they're doing, they appear to be having a good time in their life of thorns. But be forewarned, especially you young people, be forewarned, they look like they're having a good time and their laughter. But Scripture says, Wickedness burns as a fire. It shall devour, devour the briars and thorns and, and kindle the thickets in the thickets of the forest and they shall mount up like rising smoke. And through the wrath of Yahweh of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be, the people shall be, as fuel for the fire. Do we see a repeated thing here? The people of the land bearing briars and thorns. Briars and thorns, one of the quickest things that will burn is briars and thorns, and they will be destroyed. And so when you hear the laughter of the heathen while they enjoy their sin, think of it like this. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 5, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Because in their laughter they will find sorrow in the end. And their joy will become their burning. Therefore we need to avoid them and not be ensnared by them. You ever heard thorns burn? It makes a crackling sound. And so when you hear the heathen doing what they do, think of it as the crackling of thorns under a pot. Don't even think of it as laughter. Think of it as the crackling of thorns under a pot. And so we'll avoid them, not be ensnared by them. It's better to hear the rebuke of the wise, no matter what fun they seem to be having. And so we need to turn away from the life of thorns so that we might seek to dwell with Yahweh, a consuming fire. Because the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all who do wickedly will be burned up. And the thorns will be fuel for the fire, cleansing the land. Isaiah 33 verse 10 says, Now I will rise, says Yahweh. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. You shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be like the burnings of lime. Like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Hear, you who are afar off, what I have done, and you who are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Sion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? How can we dwell with Yahweh, the everlasting fire? It says, He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Don't even look at their thorny lifestyle. You don't want to hear about it. You don't need to read that news story. You don't need to watch that TV program. You don't need to see that movie. If you want to dwell with the devouring fire, Stop your ears from those things. Shut your eyes from those things. 
They will be thorns in your sides, and they will grow like thorns around you, choking out the word of Yahweh, and you will not be able to bear fruit. And so if we forsake our own ways and our unrighteous thoughts, we will dwell with the consuming fire. It says, He will dwell on high, the one who turns his eyes and ears away from these things. His place of defense will be the fortress of the rocks. Bread will be given to him. His water will be sure. Your eyes will see the king and his beauty, the Messiah. They will see the land that is very far off. And so we need to forsake our own ways, our own unrighteous thoughts, and turn to Yahweh, and we will be pardoned. And his word will accomplish what it ought to accomplish in us, and we will no longer bear thorns. Isaiah 55, verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to Yahweh, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our Elohim, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give, give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing to which I sent it, for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to Yahweh for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And so we need to be bearers like a myrtle tree, bearing good fruit. Now we know that when Israel went into the land, Yahweh had planted them into the land. As for Adam, he, did, he was desirous that they would bear good fruit and not the fruit of thorns. But what happened? Yahweh talks about what happened in Isaiah chapter 5. He says, verse 1, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones. He planted it with the choicest vine. This is Yahweh planting the children of Israel into the promised land. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, let me, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it, for the vineyard of Yahweh of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. The process of falling away is seen in this. First, we begin to bear wild grapes. And then eventually, when we choose, keep choosing the wrong ways, Yahweh stops pruning his vineyard because it's not bearing fruit. It's only when we bear fruit that we can bear more fruit through a pruning. And so he stops the pruning. He stops digging around it. He ceases 
from caring for his vineyard because it can't it's just bearing wild grapes and so what happens it begins to thorns and briars start coming up thorns and briars the sin starts overcoming the whole place you know when Yahweh sent the children of Israel into exile what was it that happened to the land he sent the children of Israel into exile of course naturally when a, a land is has a clearing in it and it's uninhabited what freely grows there is thorns Isaiah 32 verse 13 on the land of my people will come up thorns and briars yes on all the happy homes and joyous city because the palaces will be forsaken the bustling city will be deserted the forts and towers will become lairs forever and when we're not focused on the things of the kingdom the things of the of the of the heavenly things setting our affections on things above rather than things on the earth we're not doing that pretty soon what's going to start coming up in our soil thorns and briars which become snares to our souls now today we live in exile we are a part of the exile Yahweh removed the children of Israel from the land and so what happened was we became we now are children of those people and uh, and we are children of the exile and we are surrounded by a place of thorns just as the children of Israel were surrounded by people who were thorns in their sides and so on we are surrounded by thorns and very few are seeking and finding the way of eternal life and so Yahshua said Matthew 7:13. he said enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it you know people take comfort in majorities you ever notice that people take comfort when they're in a group we're like sheep if all the other sheep are doing it it must be okay is the mentality that we have and a lot of people ask me today why how can there be so many people deceived if you're really right about these things how can so many people have been deceived over so many centuries and no one realizes well I look at what Yahshua said here and says how can it be that all those people weren't deceived because few find it few and if you find it don't be looking for a crowd don't be looking for a large mega church because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and there are few who find it now there are false prophets among us seeking to entice men to bear the kind of fruit they're bearing thorns he says you will know them by their fruits sorry I guess I missed verse 15 there but um, he says beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves you will know them by their fruits do men gather grapes from thorn bushes see the false prophets are bearing thorns figs from thistles thorns and thistles the things that were a part of the curse of creation back in the book of Genesis so even so every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit a good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit every tree that does not bear good fruit which is what thorn bushes and thistles is cut down and thrown into the fire where it's consumed very quickly therefore by their fruits you will know them and so what is the good fruit what's he talking about what are the good fruits and the bad fruits well that's revealed by the next several verses because it's revealed by the end result of those many who have gone down the broad way of destruction and so he says not everyone 
who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So we've quoted this verse the last several broadcasts. And um, the ones who are practicing lawlessness are the ones who are bearing thorn bushes and thistles. In the same way, Adam was commanded not to eat from the forbidden tree. He ate it anyway. And so what happened, thorn bushes and thistles came up out of the land because he became one bearing bad fruit. In the same way, when we disobey the will of our Father, we will bear thorn bushes and thistles. Now this word translated lawlessness, as we some of you may know already, is from anomia, the number 458 in the Strong's Lexicon. The Thayers has the condition of without law because of ignorance of it, because of violating it, contempt and violation of the law, iniquity and wickedness. The Strong's Lexicon has illegality, violation of the law. And so he's going to say to many of them, who claim to be believers in the Messiah and yet live a life in violation of the law. Depart from me. You are bearers of thorn bushes and thistles. I want no part with you. I don't even know you. And so that's what happens to the wicked who, like the prophets that they followed, they're bearing thorns. And what happens to them? Isaiah chapter 9 verse 18, For wickedness burns as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns, and, and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Though the wrath of Yahweh of hosts, through the wrath of Yahweh of hosts, the land is burned up, and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother. And so we need to heed the word of Yahweh. The Torah, the fiery law of Yahweh, and let the seed of his word prevail in our hearts rather than the seed of thorns. Yahushua said in Matthew 13, verse 3, spoke many things to them in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some thirty, some sixty, some thirty. Now, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, later... In verse 19, he explained this parable to his disciples. He says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. So, but he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And so Yahushua said here, the seed, some of the seed falls among thorns. The thorns are already there when he, when he, the seed went into the ground. You know, I found this to be true when I garden. You don't have to plant weeds. Uh, they just show up. Um, but we have to be continually diligent about getting rid of the undesirables 
uh, or they will overgrow and they will shade out the healthy plant from the light of the sun. Ever found yourself in a, in a briar patch? It's one of the most frustrating things because one false move and you feel pain. Imagine yourself as a plant trying to grow and bear fruit through the pierces of thorns, which essentially come from weeds. And the, so the only way to rid yourself of the thorns is to take something sharp and cut them out, right? But that takes laboring for spiritual things. We can't be lazy about the weeds, the thorns. We can't be lazy about it. We have to labor in the spiritual things. We have to take the sword of the word of Yahweh and cut those things out and burn them. Have nothing to do with them. And if we're not willing to labor and take care of our spiritual garden and cut down the weeds and cut down the thorns that are already there. We're surrounded by thorns, my brother, my sister. We are surrounded by thorns today. We have to maintain our garden. What will happen is in our laziness, we will have, i um, sorry, Um, we will find ourselves in a hedge of thorns, basically. I'll get to that in a second. But uh, I wanted to talk about this uh, this this verse here because it's talking about several things of what the thorns actually are. And he says in Matthew, he says, He receives seed among thorns, as he hears the word, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches. That's thorns. Choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. Mark 4.19, it says, The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and becomes unfruitful. Desires for what other things? Things of the world. Things that are contrary to the word. In Luke 8.14, it says, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. And so we have the cares of this world, that's the things that choke out the word. We have the deceitfulness of riches. We have desires for other things. And we have the pleasures of life. Those are the things that keep us from bearing fruit. All we have to do in order for thorns to grow is be lazy and do nothing. And I don't have this up here, but it says, Proverbs 15, 19, The way of a lazy man is like a hedge of thorns. And uh, Proverbs 24, 30 says, I went by the field of the lazy man, the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. There it was, all overgrown with thorns. And so all we have to do is sit back, do nothing, and start thinking about other things. Start consuming ourselves with the care of this, cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. The desires for things other than Yahweh's word. And seeking the pleasures that are in this life. These thorns, my brothers, will suck up the nutrients out of our soil and then grow over top of any good planting Yahweh has put in our heart and shades our good plant from much needed sunlight. You might catch a glimpse here and there of sunlight. But brothers, we need the light. We need the word, the light, righteousness. We need the water. That's the grace through the Messiah, the giving of His Holy Spirit. We need the word and we need the spirit. We need the Torah and we need the Messiah. Do you see the connection between the Word being the light and the rain being the Spirit. We need the Torah, that's the Word, and we need the Messiah. That's the water, the grace. He says, uh, come to me and drink, Yahshua said. And those are the two ministries that will keep us growing. We can't just have a bunch of water and get no Word. There's nothing to plant. There's no planting there. 
We've got to have the word for us to bear fruit. There is no seed. And unless our seed is watered by the spirit of Elohim, then we can't grow. We can have a seed. Oh, there's a Torah, but we don't have Messiah, and so we can't grow. And so watch out for the foreign plant that grows up and entangles and entwines and blocks out the sun, the word, blocks out the light, and sucks up all the water. You know, watch out for that foreign plant because it, it maybe just start with just one, innocently. It may seem even beautiful, but a crowd's around you, growing very quickly. You try to remove it, and it pokes you. You can't touch it. You need something sharp to cut it, like the sharp sword of the word to cut it down. Now, you ever notice that the word of Yahweh only cuts you if you become like the thorns? It's the thorns that Yahweh is cutting away when his word cuts to the heart. Don't be angry when it does. Don't be upset when the word cuts to the heart. That's the sound of Yahweh cutting the thorns out of your heart. That's the, the feeling. Because there's something thorny in our heart. It needs to be cut out. Don't be like the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7. That when they heard, the, they heard these things, verse 54, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Instead, be like the men in Acts chapter 2 who humbled themselves, wanting to be delivered from the thorns. Acts 2.37, Now when they heard this message from Peter, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. Then Peter said, <clears throat> For the promise is to you, verse 39, and to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as Yahweh our Elohim shall call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation, this generation of men who bear thorns. But brothers, if we are already spiritual and we're not carnal, the word will not cut. It will become something to rejoice over. And the more spiritual we are, the more like the word we are, the more like the Messiah we are, because the law is spiritual, then the less the word is going to have to do some cutting in us, cutting away the wicked things, the wicked thorns out of our heart. But the more we're exposed to thorns, the harder it is, is it, it is for us to see the light and to value the things that Yahweh values. And your eyes become used to the darkness from the shade of the thorn tree due to the overgrowth of thorns. And so, a lot, the, uh, you, ever get, you ever sat in the dark for a while and all of a sudden somebody, somebody turns a light on? It takes some adjusting. I might even hurt. And so let's avoid this sowing among thorns. For thus says Yahweh to the men of Judah in Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to Yahweh and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Fire burns the thorns, doesn't it? And so if we've been delivered from the thorns of this world, we will not be consumed on that final day. We will dwell with the everlasting fire, and the same fire that destroys the wicked will not destroy us. But how is it, brothers, that we, we know we have a sin nature. How is it that we can be delivered from the thorns that we have allowed in our lives? 
We struggle. We battle. We have difficulty. We are challenged with the temptations of this world every single day of our life. How do we get delivered? We are the thorns. How can we dwell with the everlasting fire? Romans 7.14 says, For we know the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law, it's good. So the law is spiritual. We are carnal. We are the thorns. The Torah is the sword, the fiery sword. The fiery sword that the cherubim, the, the cherub held in his hand, guarding man from the place of paradise to be in the presence of Yahweh. That's the Torah. But we have Yahushua, Hamashiach, my brothers. The promised seed of Abraham. Remember, Abraham was asked to offer his son Isaac on the altar. And Abraham demonstrated that he was truly willing to give his son Isaac to Yahweh. Yahweh stopped him. And a ram was provided instead, one that was caught in his horns. And a thicket of thorns and briars. And so Yahweh, so Abraham called that place Yahweh Yireh. Yahweh provides because Yahweh had provided an offering and it was after that that Abraham was promised that through his seed that is the Messiah all nations would be blessed and so as the prophets predicted the Messiah would come and Yahweh would lay upon him the iniquity of us all Isaiah 53 verse 1 who will believe it? Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. This is talking about the Messiah, Yahshua, obviously. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by Elohim and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes... We are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hallelujah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he no opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The Messiah upon whom Yahweh has laid the iniquity of us all, went as a sheep before its shearers and as a lamb to the slaughter. And Yahweh laid upon him the iniquity of us all. How fitting then, my brothers, that during this sacrifice for all mankind, he would be crowned with thorns. Matthew 27, verse 27, the soldier of the of the governor took Yahushua into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and when they twisted a crown of thorns they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying Hail King of the Jews. Yahushua who bore the curse of the law at Sinai the thorny mountain became the curse for us. Being crowned with thorns, a crown that we earned, but Yahweh placed it upon him. Yahweh appeared in the burning bush of thorns. The Messiah also appeared for us in thorns. 
He is the ram that Yahweh provided to Abraham with his head wounded in the thicket of thorns. And so the giving of the Torah and the giving of the Messiah were both revealed among thorns. The Torah at Mount Sinai, the thorny mountain, and the Messiah, while his crown was made of thorns to mock, it actually was quite fitting. For the men who gave him a crowd of thorns, I mean, they were thorn-bearing men. But brethren, Yahweh laid our iniquity, our thorns upon him, and through that made him king. And brethren, though our, we through our sins are actually the one who caused the need for the Messiah to bear the iniquity of us all, the thorns. And so it's our thorns, our sins, that was placed upon him as so that we, as a burning bush, would not be consumed. So as we, as the Torah, dwells in our hearts, the place of thorns would not be consumed. So that we, like the tabernacle in the wilderness, would actually become the dwelling place of Yahweh. John chapter 14, verse 23 Yahushua answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are the temple of Elohim, and the Spirit of Elohim dwells in you? Ephesians 2.19 Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of Elohim, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yahushua Messiah himself being a chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in Yahweh, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of Elohim in the Spirit. Brothers, is it any wonder why Yahweh had the ark of Elohim, the place of his dwelling, made of acacia wood? and yet crowned with glory. Brothers, how could the Bible not be inspired from cover to cover? This is such a deep, consistent message across every single one of them books. Forty men living on three continents, written over a period of 1,500 years, yet speak one message just on thorns. We live in a land of doubters. We live in a land of thorns, but don't be afraid. Yahweh told Ezekiel, You son of man, Ezekiel 2.6, Do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words, or be dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. See, Yahweh is allowing us to dwell among thorns so that we will be tested, so that we will stay humble. You know, Paul was given a thorn in his flesh to keep him from being too exalted. He was given tremendous revelations, tremendous insight and wisdom, revelations that Yahweh had given him. He said, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Because knowledge puffs up, doesn't it? Now a demon here is called a thorn. This is because of the wickedness that's inside the demon. And so that demon was allowed to afflict him and keep him humble. And so brothers, let's hold fast to the faith. Being strong even among thorns, taking our sword, the word of Yahweh, and cutting down the thorns among us. They, some may not like it. Some don't like being cut to the heart. Some, when they're cut to the heart, they humble themselves. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 is our warning for us. Once we are blood-bought, once we are believers in Messiah Yahshua, he says, 
It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of Elohim and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the son of Elohim and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain and that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from Elohim. But if it bears thorns and briars it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. And so, brethren, don't be among those who walk away from the Messiah, who begin to doubt the word of Elohim. Don't be among those who think, I can sin all I want. I can bear all the thorns and briars that I want, and I won't be cursed. I won't be burned. That was the lie in the Garden of Eden. Satan told him, Oh, you can be disobedient. He told him, You can be disobedient. You will not surely die. But when, when Adam began to bear the thorns, he had to perish. He had to perish. And so, at the same time, don't think your own righteousness is going to cut it. Your own righteousness is not going to make it. You need the Messiah. Because we need both the Torah and the Messiah. We need the Torah to direct us, to drop, to drop seed in us, so that we can bear fruit, and we need the water, the Messiah, to make us grow. And so if you've received the Messiah, brothers, do not lose heart. There's one thing that we know all thorns can do and that's shed blood and so like real thorns there are going to be thorn bearing people of this world who would seek to shed your blood spiritually and physically persecutions but we have to resist and not choose to love our lives but rather choose to not love our lives even unto death John 12:25 He who loves his life will lose it he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life Revelation 12:11 And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death And so brothers we can overcome by the blood of the lamb by the word of our testimony and when we do, we will be the eternal dwelling place of Yahweh. And so, brethren, next time you're poked by a thorn, remember the lessons. Thorn seeds look innocent. But in the end, they get you. They get you. And pay attention to what seeds are being sown in your soil. If we allow the sins, the sin-bearing uh, thorns to grow in our hearts, we'll ultimately get hurt by them. Father Yahweh, we just pray in the name of Yahshua that you would help us, Father, to see the thorns and to cut them down with your word and to seek to grow fruit unto you, Father Yahweh. Help us, Father, to be a people that when you look down upon us, you see good plants, myrtle trees, plants that are bearing fruit, plants that are glorious for you, plants that cannot stand the presence of thorns. Help us, Father Yahweh, to be a people that want to be a dwelling place for your spirit, that seek the Messiah Yahshua for cleansing, for righteousness, that we might be that acacia wood formerly full of thorns, but adorned with gold and adorned with beauty, that we might dwell with the consuming fire and yet not be consumed like the burning bush. Yahushua's name. 
So, brethren, I don't know about you, but I'll never look at a thorn bush the same way again. I never realized the message. May Yahweh redeem us from all the thorns of sin that so easily entangle us and ensnare us. May Yahweh cause us to cleave unto the Messiah who bore our otherwise fire-ready thorns upon his head, our sins upon the tree, causing it to be that it's no longer we who live, but Messiah who lives in us, and causing it to be that through him and through him alone we can now go past the Sherevim, who bore the fiery sword to keep us from Eden, the fiery law of Yahweh which would otherwise consume us and bring us back into paradise, into the Holy of Holies, where there is pleasures forevermore in bringing us back into eternal fellowship with Yahweh once again, just as it was in the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. May Yahweh bring all of us back. And may Yahweh bless you. And may Yahweh have mercy on us all.